Okay, uh, so she's going to be talking about a species, and I just brought it up. Uh, sturgeon, one of my favorites. Uh, so Sarah's uh, talk is forced marriage or perfect union. Over 20 years building and maintaining angler engagement and keeping the life in the line. I have a bio for Sarah. So this is Sarah Schreier, executive director of the Fraser River Sturgeon Conservation Society, a research-based nonprofit charitable organization dedicated to the recovery of Fraser River white sturgeon population. For over 20 years, Ms. Schreier has provided analysis and advice to a number of organizations and sectors related to healthcare, basic research, and fisheries management. In her presentation, Forced Marriage or Perfect Union, uh, Ms. Schreier will share the story of the majestic white sturgeon of the Fraser River, the last truly wild population of the species in the world, and conservation efforts for recovery. The contribution of Fraser River Sturgeon Conservation Society volunteers and anglers has resulted in one of the best baseline data sets on a species like this in the world, creating an internationally recognized population model. The figuring out how to build and maintain relationships successfully across angler and science communities isn't easy, and in many cases remains a mystery. Sometimes relationships are a perfect union, other times a forced marriage. The trier will share highlights of over 20 years of good, challenging, of the good, challenging, and interesting the long-term relationships with anglers, science, and communication that have led to the Fraser River Sturgeon uh, Society's world-class work towards conservation of white sturgeon. Thank you, Sarah. Hi. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Hi there. Can you hear me okay, Sean? All good. Yeah. All right. Thanks, awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much uh, for having me this morning. Um, I'm really excited to be here for the American Fishery Society Conference, although virtually. Um, this is such an important time for fisheries everywhere in the world, and so I'm just really excited to share with you a little bit about our story about Fraser River White Sturgeon, uh, the history, how we got here, and um, you know what the importance is, uh, well, what we have found and the importance of the relationship between the science and the conservation side and the anglers and the conservation side. So I'll share my screen and um, tell you a little bit more. Okay, hopefully that worked. Can you guys see this okay? <laughs> yes, we can. Okay, fabulous, thank you. Um, so yeah, as Sean said, my uh, presentation is called Forced Marriage, a Perfect Union, and I really felt that this was appropriate, or cheeky, whichever you like, um, because those different uh, sectors, different groups that work together for conservation, particularly in our world of white sturgeon, um, and primarily being the science side and the angler side, whether it be rec or professional anglers, um, it's, they, they work together and they need each other, but it's not always, it's not always bliss. So first, a little bit about this fish. So it's one of the, for those of you that don't know, um, it's one of the oldest species in the Fraser. It's outlived two ice ages, can be up to 200 years old and six meters in length, which I guess says 20 feet. Um, they use both fresh and saltwater habitat and they share critical habitat with other iconic species like salmon and olecan. They slow growing, which means that they only reach uh, reproductive maturity at 26 years old for females and 12 years old for males. And they only spawn about every six to 10 years in the wild. And being this incredible icon in the Fraser now that, um, you know, it really was a species. It was a natural resource that really built the basis of British Columbia here in Canada. We've been studying this fish for over 20 years and our data shows that the juveniles are on the decline, which is not uncommon in, in complex fisheries, but there's also hope. So a bit of history, between about 1892 and 1920, over seven and a half million pounds of white sturgeon were landed and recorded here in BC. It's an incredible amount of fish that were harvested. They were shipped overseas. They're very valuable for both meat and caviar. And we, we compare this to the equivalent of clear cutting. It's like a clear cut of the population of white sturgeon. But then in the early 90s, there were dozens of these old fish, not quite the 200 year old fish, but there were old, old fish that were found dead on the uh, shores of the Fraser. Um, these fish were found from, uh, by our public, just uh, folks out on the water, but primarily by fishers. The fish were primarily female, um, but the cause of their um, 
uh, mortality was really never really determined. I mean, it was a summer where it was really warm, the water levels were low, the water temperatures were high, and it was a huge sockeye year. So what we found was these fish were absolutely gorged on salmon, It's kind of like overeating at Thanksgiving, but they were gorged on salmon and they, they basically couldn't digest. But because of all these variables that come into play with a fish that's so long lived and so old, it really, it, it caused a lot of people a lot of concern um, because it, it, if something's affecting a dinosaur species like this, uh, you know, what does that say about the health of the Fraser River? And so in order to start to get some answers and figure out what was going on, the Fraser River Sturgeon Conservation Society was founded in 1997 by Rick Hansen. And some of you may know him as, uh, well, we call him Canada's man in motion, but he truly is the man in motion. He wheeled his wheelchair around the world in the early 80s. And um, he's also a passionate conservationist. And so he brought together an amazing group of people that represented all these different sectors that have a vested interest in the species. So we have First Nations, we have biologists, we had government, we had sport and recreational fisheries, we had environmentalists, um, some of the most amazing people that were all the best of the best of what they do that came together to share their perspective although their perspectives were very different, the motivations were very different for them to see this long-term sustainability, but they brought an incredible expertise to the group that uh, started to let it, started to um, help us figure out where to, where to go, where to go with figuring out what was going on for the species. So in 2000, we launched the Lower Fraser River White Sturgeon Monitoring and Assessment Program. And when I started this job about 13 years ago, I really would have loved to have changed the name of that because it's such a mouthful. Uh, but it's a mouthful, but it definitely uh, made a massive difference in uh, fisheries monitoring. So we started our program over 20 years ago, and it was primarily built on a model that we developed that incorporates size, growth, mortality, and, and migrations and, and movements of the fish in and out of the system. We also recorded the river kilometer where these animals were encountered by our volunteers. And we also um, noted any, anything the volunteers noticed, anybody that was out there encountering these fish, you know, that you would notice unique things about the fish, whether they had markings or scars or injuries, or they were just um, had unique, uh, a unique sense about them. Now the program volunteers, like I said, were from all sectors that have a vested interest. So we had wreck anglers, angling guides, First Nations fishers, commercial fishers, enforcement, test fishery, parks. There were so many people that came together to be a part of this. And because we had such a unique group of, of uh, folks that were doing this research, we were able to do our study right across a huge, huge range of the Fraser River. So it was up to about 200 river kilometers of the Fraser. And we broke it down into four sections and we had volunteer anglers in each of these sections every year, all year round. Um, and they were collecting data for us uh, ongoing and submitting it to us um, in real time uh, after their days out. Okay. And so the model, as Sean mentioned, and, and you know, this incredible result of all of these efforts, this really is an extremely unique um, model out there for a species like this. So as you can see from this graph, the, the top line, the black one, that's the whole population space that we've been looking at. That's all of the fish that we've been sampling for over 20 years. The green and blue and red lines, those represent the different size classes, but age ranges and size classes of these fish. So we could take all of this data and break it down into all these different um, age ranges, which starts to give us a picture of, okay, what's this part of the population doing? What's that part of the population doing? And um, as you can see, the red and the blue line, those fish are those mid and larger size fish. So, you know, they're surviving, they're holding steady. And, and in many cases, they're growing into larger size classes, which is good. There's a huge amount of hope there because that's our broodstock. Those are the ones that are gonna make the, the next generation. The green line is the one that's the next generation that we're concerned about. So we've been seeing a steady decline for um, a number of years since about 2006, there's been a significant decline. Um, but because we have that bigger size classes of fish, we do have hope that with some effort that that can be turned around. 
So just a quick summary of the results and why this is so significant. Um, we've deployed over 70,000 tags. So every time we went out to sample a fish, we scanned the fish for a tag. If it didn't have a tag, we gave it one. Um, we measured it to the fork length. We did the girth. We, as I said, we mentioned the river kilometer and um, any unusual um, markings, but we've collected over that period over 170,000 samples. And that's part of what gives us this incredibly um, tight confidence bounds on it, but it makes it really unique because of the type of uh, species it is, but to have so many samples that are collected and all of these samples were, well, the vast majority of the samples were collected by anglers. And um, we chose to approach and to focus on using angling for um, primarily for the reason that rod and reel is the least we found <laughs> based on our research and our, um, on our science that it's the least invasive way to collect information and collect data on a species like this. And so with over 170,000 samples, we've got a mark rate of about 74%. So that's a pretty good uh, portion of the population. We're estimating at about 44,930 fish, roughly, give or take. Um, but because of the model we have, we can see that projecting forward, if we do nothing, this population will continue to decline. And if it wasn't for that commitment and that effort by anglers to give us that data, to give us that and uh, make that commitment to accurate data and collecting data that was uh, credible and um, you know uh, that supported this effort. You know, it we wouldn't know we wouldn't know this. We wouldn't have this type of information. So as you can see on the left hand side, that's the assessment period up to 2020. And as I said, we can project because of the samples that are out there. It takes into account fish that fish that are alive today were alive 10 years or 50 years or 75 or 80 100 years ago. But it also tells us within a very conservative mortality range that moving forward, these are the fish that we can anticipate still having in the population. But what we also have found is because we can see this, we know and we can project if we increase the survival or we increase the numbers of those juveniles, even by 1.6%, we would see an increase in about 30 years, less than 30 years. So when we started off in our first year, our anglers collected over 5,000 samples to then fast forward to over 20 years to 170,000. That partnership between science and angler and the, and the way that we were able to build this program has truly resulted in one of the best uh, baseline data sets uh, like this in the world. That partnership without it, this would not have been possible. So I get this question all the time that, so I can say over 20 years of research and maintaining all the angler en engagement, but really? And, and how? Because it, it truly uh, is in many, many cases at many different times, it is a mystery. So our approach was understanding what the shared values are. So I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna give you some broad stroke generalizations about the demographic or the profile of the science community and a profile of the angler community. And I'm certainly not meaning to be um, cheeky or uh, offend anybody. So I apologize in advance, but these are uh, broad stroke generalizations on, based on the experience that we've had for all that time. And the biggest thing that I found right across the board was no one wants to fish last fish. And they're all committed to the conservation, that fish care, sustainable practices, handling, and that science evidence-based decision-making. And that was a really big one because the, the scientists, the, the science side of it, they wanted to know that their uh, information, their knowledge was being contributed and used as evidence when decisions are being make, made. And the anglers, similarly, they wanna know that if there's regulation coming, they wanna know that it's based on real numbers and real science. So science priorities versus angler priorities. So what we found overall is, is the focus for, for the science community was building knowledge and closing information gaps. It definitely had the use of that scientific evidence, uh, priority and decision making, but it also focused on a cautionary approach. So there was a comment earlier with uh, that question about, um, you know, just because the angler, the, the angler says, well, I didn't see any fish today. And so I don't want to tell them because I don't want my fishery closed. And then, um, you know, the, the regulators looking at it going, oh, well, there was no fish found, so there must be a problem, so we've got to close it. So 
really that uh, that dynamic uh, is comes forth in, in our fishery as well. Angler priorities are sustainable fishing, access to opportunities, definitely minimal regulations, fees, licenses, closures, but they also want to have equal consideration to the knowledge and the um, the expertise that they bring, albeit not necessarily uh, from a scientific basis. So the key considerations for us was the angling community is really fact-based. They also get really frustrated with knowledge being discounted because they're not in a lab. They're not lab, it's not lab knowledge. Um, they are also frustrated with the regulation process, uh, the numbers of regulations uh, overall, and the approach and treatment by the government, again, not to be um, cheeky to any of the government attendees, uh, uh, regulators, but also the biologists. So, and oftentimes we found that they're very reluctant to adjust behavior and the way they approach their fisheries is well, first off, if they perceive that there's other sectors that are also not being held accountable for the impact their fisheries might make, but also they need the they need to be able to see it and touch it and, and understand why they have to change behavior before they're going to do that. For science, sometimes it, it's been science for science. So the things that you could know, you could learn about, but just because you can, should you, and is it gonna make a difference for the management of this um, vulnerable species? They definitely, um, we've had a, uh, an attitude about having a superior fish knowledge as opposed to what the anglers might contribute. Scientific method is, is used and that very much drives the approach. And of course, limited funding and the frustration with not being able to continue to do the work. Um, and then on top of that, because we can't continue to do the work and support the, the providing evidence and information, then there's on top of that, a perceived uh, lack of uh, regulation conservation and that too many concessions are being made for the sectors that are affecting it, including the angling community. So really, which is it? A forced marriage or a perfect union? If you can see these, the, these communities that come together to do this work, they're so vastly different, but yet they have so much in common. And so in my opinion, I think it's a perfect union. And like any union of any long-term time or in any circumstance, it's not actually truly perfect, but it's perfect in the sense that they work together, they contribute expertise that neither of them have, and that it's it's unique to the species and they both want to make a difference. And so I do believe that that relationship between science and the angler is is fundamental for this. And yeah, it's a it's a perfect union in my mind. As you can see, we have lots of folks that help us out that are part of this. And then and I wanted to show this slide and obviously to acknowledge folks that have helped us, but within all of these listed groups and foundations, the people that are behind the support, the people that are making that difference, they're anglers, they're, they enjoy fishing, they're outdoors, they're out there. And um, you know that, that really truly has made that difference. So uh, thank you again for having me here today. And I'm happy to answer some questions. I, I'm going to, well, according to whatever Sean asks me, <laughs> And uh, I'm going to take the share off of here and hopefully see you. There you go. Anyway, thank you again for having me and having me be a part of this. Thank you for the presentation, Sarah. Uh, anyone have any questions on the surgeon? Sarah, when somebody asks a question, can I just ask that you repeat it so that people on the Zoom can hear? Absolutely. No problem. Okay, yeah, far corner. Great, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I really agree with the key considerations that's brought on there. I was just hoping you could clarify the tagging study results. It, it seemed like there was um, more fish tagged than the population estimates. I think I just understood something about that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So um, the question was, uh, with regards to the tagging information, when we are putting out there that we have over 70,000 tags deployed, and yet we've got a population base of 44,000 fish and change. So what we've learned um, over the 20 years is a couple of things. So there is a mortality issue, absolutely. So we lose fish so over a 20 year period, we do lose fish every year. So that that does happen. The population also, um, you know, it. It, it does change, it does peak, it does, um, depending on the year, we'll see more fish that are unmarked. 
that come into the population. And so, um, and others then, like I said, that we lose. And we do lose a significant number of fish to um, interceptions, particularly within the gillnet fishery, within the, uh, the salmon fisheries here on the Fraser. And so it's, for the most part, it's mortality. Um, some, we don't know where they are because they got tagged and they went out to ocean and they aren't necessarily then um, re-encountered by our, our volunteers. And so there's a lot of factors into that, but primarily it has to do with uh, the moving in and out of the study space and the program space. Hope that answers your question. It's early here, so I'm hoping that it answers your question. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Sarah. All right, Dan. Just curious, so a biomark reader and biomark tags for an individual to do it is a relatively costly investment. So I'm curious if, like, how many independent uh, participants there are. How, you know, is there a minimum criteria that these individuals have to have in order to be considered for it? Did you hear that? Okay. I think so. Uh, fabulous question. Um, the question was with regards to the, the gear when you're looking at tags and, and the cost of deploying the tags and um, the numbers of folks that are part of this. So over the 20 years, we've, well, right now, we currently have about 60 volunteers that are out there. Um, again, they're, they're all trained by us. They're anglers that are trained in best handling practices. Um, they are taught how to uh, deploy the tags and take all of the measurements and, and collect all of the data. And so um, it is an expensive endeavor, <laughs> but we're very fortunate that in many cases, the anglers themselves will make a uh, contribution to the society and we can then purchase a kit that they can uh, use on our behalf. So it, it's, it's not easy, um, but of the 60 volunteers that are active out there, they, um, I would say that about 30 of them to 35 of them are professional anglers, they're angling guides, and then the others are recreational fishers. And so given the diverse group, uh, we do see the ability to provide equipment, um, you know, uh, whenever we've got it, when it's asked for. The criteria involved for uh, sampling was the other part of your question. So a passion for fishing, that's a big one. Passion for sturgeon, even more so. Um, a, a general understanding of the Fraser River, but also we break it down based on where people typically fish. So there's areas in the study, so when I, you saw the map that had the, the, the breakdown of the 200 river kilometers, there's a section of the river in that middle section, that C, that B and C section, and partly D, is primarily where the recreational fishery exists. So the, the sport fishing uh, industry and the professional guides are working in those areas primarily. So you theoretically would get a bias of, of uh, that section because that's where they're fishing. That's where the business is, that's where the industry is. However, the model that we have takes into, that, that takes into account that um, uh, selectivity, but we also have the opportunity to um, give kits to volunteers that come to us and they tell us that they fish in other parts of the river that are important to us that we need to collect data so we do um, uh, judge or uh, part of the criteria at times is where they fish and also how frequently because if you're going to have this equipment we need to make sure that we've got that um, you know fairly good frequent um, data coming in. Hey, thanks Sarah. I know we're running a little over. Um, we're supposed to be on break, but we do have one question in on Facebook. So uh, if you want to pick up and move for a break, go. Uh, oh, but uh, share if you're uh, game for one more question. Yeah, sure. So the question Absolutely. On is does the continual catching of the larger, older sturgeon affect spawning success? I was really wondering if I was going to get that question today because I always get that question. <laughs> You know what? Um, well, the, the answer is twofold. One, there is, um, when you're dealing with a, li a wild population, there is very little, if any, evidence that indicates that um, the encounter, the angling ex uh, experience, the encounter and our tagging has that type of adverse effect on the animal. Um, it would be incredibly difficult to test because you're dealing with a wild stock. There has been some studies in the in a closed containment uh, scenario where they've seen that uh, in some cases the fish will reabsorb their eggs and they'll just wait. It's not different than they'll reabsorb their eggs if the conditions aren't right, if the water temperatures are wrong or there isn't enough food around. And so 
as I mentioned previously, that was one of the key reasons why we chose rod and rail to collect the data because we knew that it was the least invasive way, it was the fastest way to get the data, and we weren't going to have those types of um, you know negative impacts that sometimes you can see with other techniques. And so, um, the 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 um, the impact of angling on spawning fish is incredibly minimal, uh, if at all. And the other piece of that is thanks to the efforts of the anglers in helping us to identify key areas where there's spawning areas, there are both voluntary and uh, regulatory closures in certain areas at certain times of year in order to be, take that precautionary approach to make sure that there is no, uh, no impact and that the fish has got the best chance. Great, thank you very much, Sarah. If everyone can give you Sarah. Thanks, everybody. And, uh, I guess we've got uh, I guess it's uh, less than 20, 15 minutes. Uh, make sure you're back in 15. Uh, Dan, 